um, the risk is speaking for him. His position was that he, he very much wanted to see a public water line here. Um, his concern was primarily that their water was relatively close and that is the most reliable way to put out a fire is to have a public water line. Um, he very reluctantly agreed that he could live with a dry hydrant if it was combined with sprinkling the homes. That was the last statement he's made. I think we might, we simply get that in writing we have before. Roy. One last thing, at least for me, uh, is, is there a site walk, you think, here in order for the board? A what? A site walk. Site walk? Yeah. I know it's a rough time of the year, but with this thought coming through, maybe we could get there before the 19th of March. So One other affirmative, Peter? Tom? Yes. I agree. I think it might be helpful for, for all members, uh, and uh, may be helpful for the applicant as well to have us uh, take a look at that. Uh, I think we should schedule that um, more than schedule for tonight. No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll schedule it right now, uh, hopefully for the next, uh, sometime in the next two weeks. Yeah. Um, time does it get dark now? About 5.30. Okay. Um, let me know as far as being being able to attend a site walk. Is it best for Saturday morning early, um, Saturday midday, afternoon I after I work? I favor Saturday morning myself. Early. 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 Five thirty. Yeah. 5 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, just kidding. <laughs> 7.30, that early, like 7.30, 8 o'clock, right. Saturday morning, next Saturday or Saturday following? Next Going Saturday's on? fine. Next Saturday? I'm not sure. I don't even know what the dates are. Yeah. It's the end of school I won't vacation be here. week. I won't be here this Saturday. So. Saturday. The following Saturday would be what date? The 2nd. The 2nd of March. Is that okay with you, John? Sure. 8 o'clock. We can meet. Is there any place to park? Um, park in the Methodist Church, Mark. Over. I'll volunteer as a trustee of the Methodist <laughs> Church. Park there. I've divulged that information before. So. Anything else that you want the applicant that we know of now that we want some type of, of uh, more detail, more information? Okay. Only if the, the applicant <coughs> considered any other new access road. And he didn't go that direction because of sight line or configuration of the property or whatever, where the board here might be flexible to avoid the impact on the mm -hmm. weapons. Hopefully we'll have some more snow melt and then we'll be able to see bare ground when we do this. The center line of the, is the, the proposed road currently marked. I, I would just ask that by the 2nd of, of March it that is. that be. It is. Actually, um, we have moved the road further to the south uh, to, to the south and what the flagging shows out there. Um, I guess when, when we widened the road, we moved it further to okay. the south. If, if just by that Saturday morning, it, it, it could be clear to us where the center line of right. your proposed road now um, is going to be. I would like to also um, uh, add to that response of, of the maximum amount of, of buffer, um, including the southwest and perhaps to the west. Um, of the vernal pool, what would be uh, your proposal for the maximum buffering? Anything else? Mr. Wilcox. Yes, Mark. Uh, Maureen, I was wondering, I have a couple of things I was wondering if you could look into in the meantime also. Uh, one would be uh, the town engineer's opinion on a dry hydrant uh, and problems associated with residential sprinkler systems. Uh, I know from that the, the new uh, small size PVC piping residential sprinkler systems are, are very popular these days. Are or aren't? They are. And they're widely used uh, on public water. I don't know about on the twist we have here about on well water. Um, I asked the fire chief about that. And, yeah. and you can put them on well water. I saw an eight story hotel complex on a sprinkler on a well system. Um, on the, on the, f the electricity, I did ask him about that as well, and he said you can design it with a hydraulic system so even if you lose water, even if you lose electricity, there's, there's an air pressure valve that releases a clapper and you still get a spray into the house. Mm. 
another thing that I'd be interested in, and at least maybe having you take a look at, is the, the text of the public access waiver section of the ordinance only refers to streets serving three or more lots and says nothing about the number of actual public access waivered lots that are being sought. You're correct. It's, it's the number of lots that are served by the road that controls whether you can reach into the subdivision ordinance to get okay. your standards. So, so, so in this case, the one lot that is not a public access waiver but is being served still counts. Still counts. Okay, so we technically should be looking at whether we need granite curbing at intersections and Different, whole different road standards and the, sidewalks also. The board has the option, as I said, the board has the option of reaching into the subdivision ordinance and using the road standards in the subdivision ordinance. Okay. Um, you're, traditionally what you've done is you've, used, you've just used the standards in the public access waiver section mm -hmm. regardless of how many lots are served by, by the road that, that's being reviewed. Mm -hmm. But you, you can do that. Tom, I, I would like to leave the applicant with some indication this evening if the board is uh, leaning toward reaching into the subdivision ordinance. I, I will go on the record as saying that I'm not leaning to go to get into the subdivision ordinance to require granite curbing in a, in a 22 or 24 foot wide road. Um, I, I would hate to see the applicant come back. Uh, he, he, the applicant knows about my disfavor of the alignment of the road, but. Uh, I think it's fair to, to let the applicant know if they need to come back with, with some uh, concern about having to curb this thing and provide sidewalks, essentially create a whole new application. It's not the first time we've run into that, and, and, and we historically have not reached back to the subdivision um, uh, requirements of design standards. Anybody? I feel it would be a detriment to the neighborhood if we did. Roy? I'm fine. Okay, I would just like to repeat that the, the site walk for 8 o'clock on March 2nd is also open to the public. Um, anything else before I hear a motion? I would like to ask the board, if, while Steve is here, if there are any questions that the members have regarding uh, the type of wetland that's out there, that the, the value of the wetland that we're crossing, um, anything that the, related to the wetland uh, that Steve could respond to. I think the only thing that I uh, would suggest that you might have a response to, and I don't know whether he needs to respond to it tonight or not, but uh, basically responding to the public comment, uh, the effect of, of the watershed from this existing site, the effect on, um, I can't remember, the, it's the Byers or the Robinson Pond. Uh, I, for instance, I don't even know how far away um, that it's pond It's approximately 2,000 feet away from this okay. property. Okay. And Steve is uh, prepared to address that. If okay. You could. I think if I either, okay, just briefly tonight, yeah. I don't want to take a long a long time, but uh, if we could, uh, just briefly, time, yeah. we have the public here, yeah. Uh, just uh, most of the, uh, the drainage uh, is going to be centered, is going to the two ponds that have been excavated, that one pond in particular. And uh, from that, there's a intermittent drainage that, that heads out, goes underneath the driveway downstream, and flows into Byers Pond and connects with the others. The, essentially, if uh, following the uh, good, solid construction standards with uh, best management practices, ero erosion control standards, there shouldn't be any influence that affects that pond that's on, on the property. Once, uh, if there's an influence into the pond, only during a high water period, you're going to get um, any kind of uh, sedimentation or, or erosion problems that are going to go beyond that pond into the streams down below. And the type of uh, streams, the type of uh, vegetation, the emergent vegetation, it's meant to, uh, they really act as a, as a purifier, as a, as a cleanser. And, and I, my feelings are you aren't going to see any real detrimental impacts to those wetlands down there. Primarily because, again, it's going to be contained in the wetlands that are right on site. Mm -hmm. Tom? Uh, I guess for the sake of discussion, uh, since we have him here, uh, I guess in a, in a scale of one to three, what's the difference between putting this road through the uh, middle of the wetland uh, across its original designated 40-foot uh, easement versus moving it closer to the upland edge? Is it a measurable difference in impact other than that the 
there's perhaps greater wetland uh, disturbance, but in the order of magnitude of the universe and wetlands in Cape Elizabeth and the site, uh, is that indeed a measurable uh, or appreciable distinction? The original, the, the original road layout, uh, when I first looked at that, that was one of my big concerns, is to always try to avoid and minimize. That's, a, that's a straight across the board. And by placing the road in the middle of that wetland, you're effectively uh, blocking um, and, you're, and you're particularly impacting the upstream edge of that wetland. So there's been a great uh, improvement by moving this road to where it is now. And, um, even with the fact that there had been some clearing, uh, just some cutting in that, that wetland area. That's um, the whole point is, is try to keep it as large a unit as the integrity of one unit is, as large as possible is, I think, is very important there. And, and where the, the road is located now, it's in an area that's kind of is, is up on the up, upland edge. It's an area that's uh, uh, loamy sands that, that are you know, they're head scratchers when you're out there determining is this really a true wetland or not. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where, that, where it's located now. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Do I hear a motion? I think we're in order to table. Is this an instance where we need the uh, uh, mutual agreement of the, the applicant? No. No. Okay. Do I hear a motion? Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Mark. I'd like to order, offer the following motion. Be it ordered that based on the plans and the materials submitted and the facts presented at the request of Shore Woods Incorporated, Sandman Associates Incorporated, and Cantor Corporation for a wetland alteration permit and public access waiver for lots 1, 2, 4, and 5 located off Cantor Lane be tabled to the regular March 19th, 1996 meeting of the Planning Board. It has been moved. Do I hear a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Those opposed, it's a unanimous vote. See you next month. <coughs> oh, Steve. Paging Mr. Parker's. Paging Mr. Steve Parker. <coughs> this was very helpful. He's ah, <laughs> item of all business on tonight's agenda, uh, Dominicus Crossing Subdivision request by Abbott Land Associates for preliminary subdivision approval and a wetlands alteration permit for a 94 lot in supposed to be three. Yes. In three unit <coughs> subdivision located off Wells and Sawyer Road section 16-2-4, major subdivision completeness in section 19-3-9, wetland alteration permit completeness. And Maureen's going to give us an introduction for this. The applicant is here and is going to be putting up plans very shortly. Um, this came to the board last month after several uh, planning board workshops. It was deemed incomplete. Uh, the applicant is back this evening searching for completeness. Uh, some of the, the, the one item I'd, I'd like to go over, um, two items. First of all, the, the comments of the town engineer are attached. Um, he has, has 
well into his technical review. Uh, in his recommendation, the application is substantially complete, and he's now into the, the detailed review. He's continuing that. He has not gone through all the pages yet. Uh, the other major issue that came up at the last meeting was a right title and interest and financial and technical capability. Um, on the podium tonight, you had the last, what I believe is the last piece of, of that whole issue. Uh, the applicant has revised the application submission sheet. The new applicant is the Dominicus Crossing Limited Liability Company. A new survey has been submitted showing that all the land in question is either owned by the limited liability company or there is a purchase and sale agreement between the current owner and the limited liability company. Uh, the applicant has uh, disclosed financial information to the town manager and the manager has written a memo to the planning board basically stating that financial capability appears to exist. Um, and the technical capability uh, still was a problem at the time I wrote the memo to the board. Uh, what the applicant has done and, and what is on the podium tonight is there is a um, a joint venture agreement between the applicant and uh, Anastas and Loans and the joint venture agreement demonstrates that, that all, all aspects of construction are going to be uh, heavily, uh, there. the applicant is heavily relying on Anastas and Loans. At a previous workshop, uh, Anastas and Loans submitted information to the board demonstrating um, elements of technical capability. Specifically, they listed the projects that other subdivisions they've completed in other communities and, and additionally uh, information on some homes that they had constructed. Um, the, the assignment of joint venture agreement is the joint venture agreement between Anastas and Loans was between Anastas and Loans and the Buck Land Associates. And now that the applicant is the Dominicus Crossing Limited Liability Company, they have been assigned all the Nabuck Land Associates um, rights in that joint venture agreement. Mm -hmm. So um, that's all the information that I have on right title and interest and financial and technical capability. Are there any questions? I, the only piece that I was missing was the, the technical capability of, of uh, Manassas and Lonis. And um, you said that that was submitted earlier. I, I have, I didn't receive any. I don't know if it was part of our, our packet or not. Um, I'm familiar with their work, but I don't know if they've ever handled a, a subdivision of more than 25 watts before. Uh, I, the reason we have technical capabilities in there is that, that um, someone needs to show, and perhaps List and I will simply have to, um, I don't have to simply anything, I guess, uh, take what you, you tell me as far as that they have submitted that information. I certainly haven't seen it. Um, what was submitted? Did they, did they it, submit that it as was, part of the package itself? No, it, is, it is not in your binder. It was submitted during, uh, I think it was the first or the second workshop that the applicant came to the board on. So it's, it's not in your binder right now. Um, I believe that, that um, the applicant would be more than happy to resubmit that information as part of the formal application. And perhaps if you wanted to list some of the subdivisions that you that have been, I'm most familiar with the Nassus and Loans work in the town of Yarmouth. And I believe the applicant could talk about some of the other work they've done tonight and perhaps follow that up with a list of projects that they've completed as part of this formal review. I guess the most interested in their, their role as general contractor um, in that role, because that's the role that they will be picking up in this case, um, in that the principles of of uh, de minimis crossing LLC don't have technical or don't aren't offering any uh, evidence of, of uh, technical capability in that so uh, it would be just um, an assets and loanness that, that uh, um, have to prove the, the technical capability. I, I consider it to be a, a, a serious issue uh, if they've never general contracted the subdivision of more than 25 lots before um, I, I'm not sure uh, about the technical capability. Perhaps they have that evidence with them. Through the chair, I'd like to address that. Uh, sure. With me tonight is Bob Stevens. Uh, Bob is a broker with Anastas and Lonis, and perhaps he could address that very question. Um, 
I think the, the issue is what, what is the track record for Anastas and Lonis and Peter Anastas prior to Anastas and Lonis relative to a, a subdivision of this magnitude? I get, most are not in their house building. They were not concerned about their home building capabilities, but their abilities as a The whole pack, starting from the permitting, land purchase, right. and the application through the local. Yeah, I don't need building. a long history, but it, yeah. so you can give some examples of, of, of subdivisions <coughs> in excess of 25 lots. Yes, sir. We've done several. Royal Point in Yarmouth, which was a 23 lot subdivision, Royal Meadows, a 10 lot subdivision. Uh, those were both in Yarmouth. We have uh, Pheasant Hill, which is a 25 <coughs> lot subdivision in Poole and currently under construction. Uh, Oakwoods in Yarmouth, which is a 57 lot subdivision and uh, involved in the original uh, application of uh, Applewoods in Yarmouth, which again was a 57 lot subdivision. In no Oak Hill and, and um, what was it, the Applewood? Applewood was, was the original the application. Was and Lonis the general uh, contractor? Originally, but the original application in, yes, and then uh, he sold out. I, I'm asking you, was he the general contractor in the development? No, uh, not. He, was he the general he was contractor in, in, and developer in, uh, in Oak Hill? In Oakwoods. 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 Yes. And also Royal Point, Royal Meadows, and Pheasant Hill. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I guess just that being part of public record, the, the special. Would you like to uh, begin? I would. Uh, I'll begin by saying uh, Maureen has pretty much covered all the information that uh, we have submitted in the last, the last submission of February 2nd. And then there was a supplemental submission that Juan Perez made, uh, the joint venture agreement and the assignment of the uh, joint venture agreement, uh, which happened last Friday. Um, if you'd like, we could just go over the letter that summarizes the information that was submitted to us on the February 2nd. If you'd rather uh, we didn't do that for the sake of time, we'd certainly be happy not to go over that information. Um, it's my understanding that the purpose of tonight's meeting is, is primarily to determine whether or not we have a complete application. And if that is uh, deemed to be complete, we would like to entertain a discussion on some of the substantive issues. Uh, we do have a memo to you dated February 6th regarding the, uh, an approach that we felt might be applicable concerning the order that we approach some of the application uh, discussion. Does, <clears throat> does the board want to, to go over this? Um... Uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, I voted at the last meeting to find it uh, substantially complete. Uh, I, I feel comfortable voting on it with the information I have uh, before me. Uh, that's my opinion. I, I think the issues, that, the only three that we really were needed to, that we felt were uh, lack completeness was uh, tying in the general contractor um, legally to the process, um, providing technical capacity or uh, capability. <laughs> And uh, financial capability, and, and one board member, I, I think that those have been covered from a completeness issue. I'm prepared to vote yes for completeness. If anyone wish to make a motion? Mr. Chairman? Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Dominicus Crossing Limited Liability Company for preliminary subdivision review and a wetland alteration permit for Dominicus Crossing, a 94 lot plus three multifamily unit subdivision located in the area of Wells Road and Sawyer Road be deemed complete. I'll second the motion. There is one clarification in that motion, if I may interject. Um, it's really a 96 lot subdivision, including three multiplex buildings. It's not a 94 lot subdivision. Ninety-six lots, which includes three multifamily multiplex. Multiplex. Yeah, they're, they're truly. There's the barn feed apartments, lots, which is feed on lots themselves. one lot, and then there's the the duplexes, 
which are the two, two, it's getting very light, two low-income um, affordable housing projects. Would you like to revise your motion? Certainly. Uh, I'll revise uh, to uh, change it from uh, Domin Dominicus Crossing, a 92, a 96 lot uh, <coughs> subdivision, which includes uh, three multiplex units located in the area of Wells Road and Sawyer Road, et cetera, uh, be deemed complete. And second, it is amended. Any, fur <coughs> any further discussion? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, this, this application has been through five workshop sessions, uh, I, and we're at preliminary subdivision at this stage. I am really, I don't know what the term is, but when I read through the engineer's comments, which are um, phenomenally uh, detailed, uh, I would like to offer a workshop session for the planning board to re review and consider uh, what it requires to get to this stage in the process and how how uh, appropriately the planning process works when there's this level of detail and review at preliminary subdivision. Uh, we certainly have to balance the interests of the town versus the balance of the applicant. But uh, the effort that's put forth here and the level of re review is, is phenomenal. Uh, and what I would refer to as a review of construction documents. And uh, it's an effort that, that I feel is, <laughs> is losing the forest for the trees and vice versa. Uh, that we know each little tree, but we haven't caught, grasped, or agreed to the size of the forest. And I don't think that it does the town a lot of good. I think it's an enormous, enormous investment on the applicant's part. And uh, I don't know that we have any way around it in this particular process, but over this particular application, but it's one that is of grave concern to me if we have other applications of this scope and scale that we are, are this committed into the design and, and uh, uh, layout of the of the project with this effort put forth in this level of review with no real this is the first substantive review that the planning board has had of, of this application other than workshop and if any of us have any major concerns about the layout of this of this of this uh, development um, it's just a phenomenal investment that's been made both on the town's part as well as the applicant's part to get this far and it, it just seems to be something inherently uh, not not uh, useful uh, in getting that much detail this soon in the process. But I think that's uh, an issue to be discussed at workshop. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other comments? Towards that end, our engineering staff, BH2M, has scheduled a meeting with T.Y. Lynn, which is Fred Morn, Steve Bradstreet, and the traffic engineer next Wednesday afternoon, I believe. We can tomorrow uh, to talk about the sum and substances of the issues that Tom just addressed. Uh, we likewise share Tom's concerns that you know, we, as we indicated in our letter of February 6th, would like to have a discussion, perhaps even tonight, on some of those big picture items and then to start honing in on some of the details. Uh, the engineers, of course, took a look at the details, going page by page and detail by detail. Um, our concern also is that they may have uh, omitted a consideration of the big picture. And I, I share Tom's frustration with that process, but this is where we're at right now. We do feel, though, there are a number of those large picture items that do need to be addressed right up front. And if we could you know, spend some time this evening to get into that, we'd appreciate that. Yeah. Any further discussion? OK, all those in favor as the motion as read? Please raise your right hand. Those opposed, it's unanimous. Would you like to start off with some sort of areas that you feel may be a concern to us? Okay. The when we submitted the application, we recognized that yes, we've had. Site walk, we've had five review meetings. We've had many sit-down sessions with Maureen and town staff. Um, and we've always been approaching this on the basis that we've only gotten a head nod without really any vote as to the direction of things like you know, the access road question, the use of the open space, and many of the other large 
picture elements. Um, we're at a point now where we've made some decisions. We've made a lot of commitments to certain elements of the plan, certain patterns of land use, and we hope that we're on the right track. And we would like to take this opportunity tonight, as much as time as you can spare us, to let us know how you feel at this point about the way we've laid the development out, the way we've allocated our open space, the way we've incorporated affordable housing, uh, the way we access out into Wells Road. All of those have major implications towards the ultimate layout of the development, uh, the way we're going to be treating stormwater, the way we're going to be treating our road layout, and so forth. Um, the engineering work that's been developed already and has been reviewed course has made certain assumptions that those are the places where we're going to be putting the roads and the pathways and so forth. Um, it's unfortunate that it goes in that order, but here we are. Uh, when we thought about how best to approach this then, uh, on the February 6th memo, we felt that there may be a logical way to look at this, starting with the, the larger issues, the more global concerns, then working our way into the things which may be um, somewhat more site-specific. And in asking these questions in these orders, in this order, we felt that if there's some things that you felt needed to be adjusted or changed or relocated, now's the time to do it, rather than dealing with the, uh, I don't want to call it nitpicky issues, but the smaller detail issues up front. Um, so we put before you a, a suggested order. and. Perhaps this is presumptuous on our part, but we felt that it was a way to start organizing the review process. Um, and we looked at um, seven or eight major categories, the first being the application itself, right title or interest, the financial and technical capability. Second was subdivision layout. You know, are we right in assuming the numbers that we've, that we've used for the net residential acreage calculation? What about the road layout, the way we've located the entranceways, the way we've use the topography to lay the road out. Uh, the lot layout, how does that comply with your understanding of the ordinance, the way you've looked at the land when you've reviewed the plans, and when you've, when you've walked the site? Uh, what about the use of open space, the buffers, the trails, and finally the phasing? We've also asked for a number of waivers. Um, three or four are listed right now, the two-foot contour, soil mapping, road design, uh, we've also asked for another one in the report that we've uh, submitted on uh, February 2nd, namely um, a waiver of the location of buildings within 300 feet of wetlands. We also feel that a discussion of the wetlands alteration permit, which has an awful lot of detail, needs to be addressed in a lot of detail. We do have um, people from Woodland Alternatives who could come and address some of the specifics of that particular application. Um, on the second page, we've identified the number of the community infrastructure issues, the forced main sewer, the on-site disposal in Lot 63, the use of street lights and the location of street lights, stormwater management, which is a major concern of ours, the restoration plan for Wells Road and Spurwink Avenue, um, the issue of affordable housing, the unit design, for the low income and moderate income housing, uh, the location of affordable housing units, and the provisions for long-term long affordability. And finally, last but certainly not least, is the issue of community impact. And we have, as, as Maureen pointed out, um, added some additional information relative to the school impact as part of the package that you got uh, this evening. So that's where we're at right now. Uh, I guess what I would like to, to ask um, for your comments on that approach in terms of reviewing the, uh, the application. Uh, there are a lot of people we can bring in. Uh, Les Berry, we can bring Jack Murphy in to talk about traffic. Uh, we have additional people to bring in on other specific issues. Uh, and if we knew uh, when they were needed, it would certainly help in our, from our standpoint in scheduling uh, their time. <coughs> Anyone like to begin? <laughs> I, I'll just make a comment that, you know, I, I appreciate your, your organization of this, and, and I agree with you. I, you had asked us at the last meeting how we plan to go about it, and I, my basic response was we really don't have any 
sort of falls together, and, and, and unfortunately, that can add time to your your efforts and time to, to that we spend on that. And I appreciate your effort to, to organize this. I think we should follow that that outline. It does not mean that we can't come back to an issue at any one time. Uh, I think it just gives a good outline to, to, to follow. I, I think it's. I have some issues that I think you need to know about tonight because they're not earth shaking. But at the same time, let's not go any length of time without understanding my perspective on a certain number of things. And I think those initial items on, on the big uh, big items are what we need to, to get out to the forefront and then try to organize it into your outline of let's pick them off. In we, we would appreciate that. Before we get to midnight tonight. Well, we realize <laughs> we should have been over 15, 20 minutes ago. But we're willing to stay as well, long the, as you. The chair that was on duty before this just couldn't control <laughs> this crowd. <laughs> Or do you want to begin your? Sure. I, I, just some issues that I that I think are really important, and to satisfy my um, my concerns about the 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 main access road. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about that, the why it's where where it is. Um, I just want to to make sure that you, as applicant, and we as board, have, have completely exhausted the opportunities. What is the best site? I've heard responses uh, from our town meeting or the town staff met. Uh, they think it is where it is right now. I guess the only question that I have is there's a lot 22 uh, which is around the bend further. Was there ever any original plan that showed access from that which is which would be west of um, the driveway into the to the to the uh, Mr. Brez's barn. The, the lot that you're talking about is this one down here. Yeah. Uh, we did look at that. Uh, we felt that the site distance at the top of the hill there uh, was very, very iffy. Mm -hmm. And we felt also that bringing an access road out of that point would directly affect, you know, five or six houses that are right in that general vicinity. Okay. Did the that is a location also of a pumping station? Is that am I correct? No, the, well, the location that you're that we're talking about is at the very crest of the hill, right? Right at the, the southwesterly corner of the property. The pumping station is at the easterly corner of that lot right. 22. Right. The site does I see that as the only other straight stretch of road, and and I don't have in front of me the topo, so uh, it may be a case of, of, of uh, vertical site distance. But I'm looking at a, at a road that comes straight through, for instance, right where it says lot 22. And I'm asking vertical you. Vertical curve at that point, okay. too. Okay. In the, in the current proposed access road, we have a, a right of way of 50 feet. Um, this, in the travel, in the, the, the the, the travel, the, the paved surface there is going to be at what width? 20 feet. 20 feet. So there's plenty of room there um, to avoid any uh, <coughs> encroachment on, on the, uh, the uh, I think it's the Leighton lot. Is that correct? That's correct. I guess the, the next issue that I, I want to, to jump to uh, myself <coughs> deals with um, phase one uh, and phase two. And I'm sort of jumping around because of the sort of touching down on the, the issues that I want to resolve fairly early. And um, you've proposed an open space um, sort of, I guess, as, as to be some center of this neighborhood. And, and that's what's a key piece that we, we, we stressed throughout the, the five workshop uh, time period to, to try to create some sense of neighborhood in these areas. And, and um, uh, maybe I made the assumption that the open space in that neighborhood would be a focus of that. My sense of, and, and my recollection of walking this site, is that what you have proposed seems to be um, sort of a simply a leftover spot that's open. Um, we're looking, I think, at what, 37 lots in, in this phase, approximately? Phase one. 47. 46 in that area, and then 47 is 
my concern is, is you know, 47 lots, um, the probability of having um, 50 or 60 children in, in that neighborhood um, in an odd-shaped parcel that you have uh, for open space, recreation space. Um, I really don't, number one, it's not very central to the neighborhood. Number two, um, I'm not sure that it really lends itself to, to being uh, a focal point uh, for the neighborhood uh, to do anything. Uh, uh, I, I was hoping that you might create something that is more of a town um, or a village green in, in the center area, uh, whether there's another lot that fits that purpose better. Um, in conjunction with that, these, the, the eyebrows that, that, that you have designed into Dominicus, Dominicus Crossing Road here and in phase two, I know the town engineer didn't like them very much. I don't see any use for them. Uh, you had uh, mentioned that they created a sense of focus for the neighborhood, and I, I just can't imagine how that could possibly be. Um, you know, I, I don't see kids gathering in the middle of the road on the island, um, or, or adults meeting there to talk in the evening uh, in the middle of the road as a center of a neighborhood. I think that was um, in the visual sense, not in a physical sense. Uh, then, in, in that case, I think you can do a lot better uh, in, in doing that. I, I, there's some added benefit from your perspective of, of speed control and so forth. Um, I'm not sure that the public works liked the idea or, or whether it was Fred Moran that didn't like the idea of speed control. I, I think your road, basically the road layout is, 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 is fine. I, you know, it, 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 uh, it's the issue of, of creating neighborhoods. Uh, phase two, that seems to be the only focal point in the neighborhood and it's just a poor excuse for uh, a gathering place for for adults or children uh, in the middle of the road um, physically um, I would ask you to take another look at that whole concept and how you might efficiently correct that issue whether you place the um, little phase I know there was a notice from uh, or note from the town manager um, from perhaps it was from the staff meeting um, indicating a desire to have some recreational facilities, uh, small, limited, soccer field, baseball field type, but maybe even smaller than that. But I mean, certainly there's, there's, there's the space to do that, but what's, what's there now doesn't really do it. Okay, I, I guess I'll leave my, my comments uh, at, at that. Um, I guess my next comment is, is on the community impact analysis. Uh, I, I said before, I said a month ago, that, that it was not a case of completeness, that, that, it, was, that it was just not sufficient. Um, the amendment or addition that you made to it still doesn't do it. I, I, I couldn't understand why you're trying to limit the demographic study of two other subdivisions to, to, to create a community uh, impact analysis study. If you need to hire somebody to do that study, then that's what you need to do. Previously, it was because the demographic basis wasn't based on the town of Cape Elizabeth. You'd drawn in other similar communities. That's not the idea of community impact analysis. Uh, to compare this with the demographics in a couple other subdivisions uh, is not the point of community impact analysis. It was a key piece uh, that was brought up uh, both publicly and by this board early on in the workshop area that, that anything short of uh, a good, strong community impact analysis is just not going to be accepted. Uh, one, one board member's opinion is that it still falls far short of, of what... Could you expand upon that and tell me more specifically what you're looking for, what was lacking, and what we provided? What was, it, what was lacking the first time is you used demographic information, population, population change, population strata, information from other towns, not that in Cape Elizabeth. That information is, is there's a wealth of information on, on Cape Elizabeth demographics through the entire town of, of, of the impact, not only in the schools, um, every piece of demographic information you can possibly want is available. Um, there's limited amount in the, uh, the comprehensive plan. Uh, there's all kinds of demographic information available through demographic uh, uh, information companies, UDS, um, Connolly's, 
Uh, $215 will buy you more information than you ever want about the town of Cape Elizabeth and every residence here. The issue is, and I'm not going to instruct you on how to do a, a community impact analysis, uh, but is to take the, the change in population based on the current demographic standards of, of what will be the impact on um, the, the facilities in the, the, the town of, of Cape, Elizabeth, Cape Elizabeth based on the population change required to absorb into 95, 96 uh, housing units. Uh, how you go about that, uh, that you need to, to access uh, somebody who writes community uh, impact uh, analyses. I'm just saying what you have so far falls short. Um, Number two, the, there's, um, the, the reduction of the, of the plan makes it difficult for me to see where the sidewalks are. I can sort of guess, guesstimate. Um, I think I mentioned one of the workshops they sit on the, the P2 committee, which is the pedals and pedestrians, I think it is, and, and bikeways and so forth. I, um, I will be looking at, it, at the five foot width, where they, where they run. Uh, like I said, I, I couldn't see that real well in the reduced plans. I may be able to get some um, enlarged plans from uh, Maureen. I'll take a look at those. I think that you're proposing something fantastic for this neighborhood. Um, my, my recollection that in the notes from the staff meeting is that you're, they're looking for a full reclamation of, of uh, Wells Road after the sewer is, is, is uh, completed. I would ask that in conjunction with that or at that same time that you pr make a uh, proposal to uh, on the surface of Wells Road to include a shared bike path shared lane uh, facility which may not even in entail changing the, the the width of the uh, the, the road I would uh, um, perhaps uh, um, uh, perhaps go through Maureen uh, to get information. I don't want to be the, the pivotal point there as far as access of information, what, what we're looking for. But there'll be a key, while that is being done, without additional judge, other than changing where the center line in the road is, perhaps we can accommodate the, the bike lane from um, the, 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 the subject site to Scott Dyer Road. Um, I guess. And I'll leave with this, although I have some others. I'll take a break. Uh, affordable housing. Um, what I'm looking for there is I think you've got some great ideas, but I want you to be able to produce in writing uh, how you defend that that's affordable. In other words, you're picking four. My understanding is you're picking four low income, which is 80% of greater Portland median income affordability, and two moderately affordable, 150%. Show mathematically how somebody, I don't even know what the, what the, the Greater Portland median income, if it's 38,000, uh, how somebody uh, on 80 percent of that income, uh, $32,000, can afford those units. In other words, whatever, whatever current underwriting stand is, 2836, residential uh, underwriting, how do they afford that based on a certain um, cost estimate to build, based on a certain site value? Just say, I, I would like to see in writing how I come up with that. Uh, I think I saw something at a $150,000 price range on, on the units. Um, doesn't seem, at least initially, that it fits the 80% the of the low income uh, bracket for the greater Portland median income. I'll take a break. <clears throat> Mr. Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In your recent proposal to us, you used the two subdivisions that you had been involved with in the past in Yarmouth <clears throat> and in Following along with Mr. Edsel's comments, uh, your figures show a 0.7 number of children in each household. Uh, again, I don't think that information is, is relevant to the town of Cape Elizabeth. I very quickly went down and spoke to the, the director of transportation for our school system, uh, pulled some neighborhoods very similar to what you're proposing here. Stonegate, for example, has almost 65 school-aged children in that residential neighborhood. Wainwright Circle, which is a very small subdivision, very near your proposed subdivision, has 11 school-aged children in it. And I believe there are only six houses there. Uh, if you go into Sherwood Province, uh, Forest, if you go into Brentwood, uh, 
even if you go down my, na my neighborhood on State Ave, you're going to find that the people who buy homes in Cape Elizabeth, I'm sure Mr. Parkhurst will back this up, the first question they ask and speak about is our school system. People move to this community because of our schools, and they move here with two and three children. This is why we just had to build an $11 million school. And I'd like to see that concern answered in your reports to us. I think the towns of Yarmouth and Falmouth and, and Cumberland, north of Portland, are not like the town of Cape Elizabeth. We have a very young population here, and it's become very costly for the town to address their needs, specifically in education. And thank you. Mr. Emery. Mr. Chairman, uh, as, as you know, uh, I've been one who's been very concerned about the point of access uh, for the development uh, for two reasons. One, um, I'm not a real fan of what I'll call flag lot development, where one uh, individual uh, enjoys the impact of an enormous uh, development, and particularly using a 50-foot right-of-way when one owns or has access to hundreds of acres of property. Uh, there's, there's an inordinate uh, or unfair sharing of the impact, in my opinion, by that one abutter in, in a situation like that. Uh, the applicant has submitted evidence from uh, Jack Murphy indicating that other areas are, are, um, would barely meet the uh, minimum site distances, and uh, in addition, we have letters from abutters uh, uh, preferring that one abutter share the um, impact rather than distributing uh, uh, among more abutters. Um, it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon, and that's all I'll say. Um, but I'm still not convinced uh, for two reasons that, that the access in, is in the appropriate location. I, I guess primarily because it doesn't lend much to the overall uh, sense of neighborhood that, that's being proposed here, that uh, one winds up through a narrow 50-foot right-of-way uh, and then uh, opens up into this, into this uh, greater development. Uh, I think the applicant is, is faced with a very challenging problem here, and I think it's uh, at least this planning board has a unique opportunity, having gone through developments in the 80s and the windy road through the woods, uh, uh, big house subdivision in Cape Elizabeth, and the comments that we've heard time and time again is it doesn't seem to be consistent with the rural character of the town, that we have isolated neighborhoods at the end of cul-de-sacs that don't in any other way uh, intermingle with the town. Uh, and and they're sort of there's, there's nothing unique about that other than it's it's a wiggly road through the woods, and I'll be uh, quite blunt. I don't know that I know that there's a greater or, or a better alternative. Uh, there's certainly a school of thought that it would be a, um, a a wonderful idea to put a grid over a piece of property and create a a, a more modern development based on traditional uh, neighborhood planning concepts. Uh, I don't know if this is indeed the, the appropriate site to do it. Um, and, and I think things that would help me to understand that better, what I'd like to do is sort of do a, uh, uh, my greatest concern here is that this applicant is going to go through a, a multi-month process. Uh, we're going to get comments about whether the ratio on the riprap uh, on drawing such and such is consistent with drawing such and such. And we're going to end up with the same subdivision that we've all lamented about for the last uh, four years and, and, and have lost a unique opportunity. Uh, and, and it's a very difficult situation because we have a, uh, an applicant here who has certainly has, uh, has the backing of the comprehensive plan. Uh, this, this site was identified in the comprehensive plan as, as a, uh, uh, a site appropriate for, for development. Um, and, and it's sitting out in, in the edge of, of uh, open fields, and it's a forested hillside uh, with wonderful views over the marsh. And it, I don't know that there's a precedent for doing a subdivision on that type of property that leads any of us with sort of the traditional New England neighborhood uh, uh, feeling. And ultimately what this, this plan addresses is all of the town requirements for avoiding wetlands, federal regulations for minimizing wetland crossings, um, and meeting uh, <coughs> cluster development provisions, uh, and it's done an enormous or gone through an enormous effort to get there. But I don't think that it's, it hasn't satisfied me, and, and from the general tone of the board, I'm not convinced 
<coughs> by the board that the board's convinced that this is the next level of, of residential planning uh, for town of Cape Elizabeth. It's more of a very uh, typical planning that we see. Um, and, and that may be the reality that we're faced with when we deal with environmental planning, that we don't superimpose a grid over the, over the land, that we simply avoid rock outcrops and we avoid wetland crossings, and we have uh, customers that want, want a minimum lot of an acre or so, and they want to put a 2,500 square foot plus house on that lot, and they want to have a fence in front, and they want to have a three-car garage. Uh, those all come down to pretty common denominators, and we can see them everywhere. So. Uh, I think what I'd like to do is participate in this process, but not try to be the designer. Uh, and I don't think that the board should be the, the client's designer, and I certainly don't think that the applicants' representatives here tonight have any interest in this board uh, designing this project. Um, but I would like to work, work through this process in the most constructive way uh, possible to come up with, um, I think, something that, that the town can be very, very satisfied with that, that's taken one of its largest development parcels uh, in growth areas and, and has left this community after this multi-month process with something that uh, the applicant is, is, uh, can, can uh, be, uh, have a successful development, a profitable development, a, a development that phases logically and, and affordably uh, and profitably <coughs> and leaves the environment uh, in, in, good, in good standing and uh, is, a, is a pleasure to ride and walk through. So I guess to, to, to that end, um, I, we get back to the issue of the main access road. I'm not convinced that it, that it again, lends much either to, uh, to the overall layout of, of the development. I have a, a really strong uh, desire to see a, a focal point in the development or each phase of the development that uh, sets the tone for the character of that neighborhood. Uh, I'm not going to criticize the um, uh, little island in the road. Uh, there are some real good examples of that. I think the most you know, if you take it to the extreme and, and consider something like an English square, which is, is a nice green area surrounded by road that nobody, that people indeed have to cross a road to get to, uh, that's a different situation than we have here. Uh, I think Terry has pointed out in some of his writings that those areas are also left to avoid, uh, there's rock outcrops, significant differences in grade that take advantage of splitting the road at those locations. I think a site walk is really necessary to determine whether or not those are as powerful in, in the real world as they are proposed on paper. <coughs> um, the other issue that, that I have is um, we've, we've recently uh, given a public access waiver on Scott Dyer Road. We have a relatively small scale house being built. I think you know the, the house that I'm talking about that the Fitzpatrick is, is building out there. And it's a, it's a small scale house. But it's interesting how it emerges up out of the trees that uh, in going by an area that seems wooded and rural and we look at the plans and it's <coughs> set back from the road, we all have this vision that, this, that it's going to nestle into the woods and all of a sudden up it comes. And it's, it's a very well-scaled house. A, a curiosity of mine, and I don't know that there's any, any requirement in the ordinance that you provide this, but uh, I think one of the great surprises of this development is going to be for people who are driving along uh, Bowery Beach Road or Spurwink Road uh, at the Scarborough Line and, and get to the bridge past the uh, cemetery at the bottom of the hill and look across the marsh and, and look up the hill and they see uh, the houses that, that are indicative of houses now that tend to have nine and ten foot ceilings that are two to two and a half stories high that are very large in scale. Not only do they have sizable square footages, but they've, they've taken on a whole larger character. Um, and I think we're trying to nestle those into some fairly, um, well, not tight, but uh, close lots, particularly in, in phase one. And I don't know if there's any way that the applicant can help us to understand that. Certainly, I think we requested during the workshop is, is something that shows a typical neighborhood layout that, that shows how houses might be arranged from lot to lot. Um, and it might be used as a sales tool. I know that in Stonegate, for example, people spent a lot of money on lots and they built enormous houses and very expensive houses and ended up with less privacy than, than uh, many people have in much smaller neighborhoods. Uh, and I think sort of thinking about the relationship of lots and the, and, and the relationship of houses is a very strong marketing tool when you're dealing with a unique uh, uh, client base or customer base. And something that would help me to understand the scale of the lots and the scale of the development and the ultimate impact or benefit of cluster development. Um, 
particularly in the, in the early phases. So uh, I don't know what, I, I know you have the tools, Terry, to do uh, imaging, um, but I don't know. I know it's a very expensive process, uh, but I think it might be helpful if, if somehow consideration is given to going back, because we do have a report about visual impact on the community, and I, I have a sense that this is going to be a, quite an alarming situation for many residents after the fact. Uh, I think probably within the development it, it may be unnoticeable depending upon how much of the tree line is left and, and, and how the lots are cleared, but I think as you get away from the development and look across the marsh and up the hillside, uh, it's, it's going to be um, potentially could be jolting to people. So it would be interesting to me to take some relative elevations, uh, a photograph and some relative elevations and superimpose the house that we have uh, that was included in the package, which obviously is not the only house that's being proposed in the development, but it's indicative, I think, of the scale of houses that uh, the reputation of Anastas and Loans uh, is based on. Uh, and I do that so that we all recognize that part of the development impact. Uh, there's nothing in the ordinance that, that uh, restricts, I mean, we have a, we have a height limit, you have a, the, you're meeting the, the density, uh, requirements and your permitted use within the zone. I just want to do it so that we have an informed uh, idea of what the impact is before it occurs. Uh, lot layout, I think, uh, is attributed very much, obviously, to the issue of wetlands, uh, rock out crops, uh, wiggling between those, trying to maximize getting as much double loaded lot uh, to road as, as possible. There's just something about the overall layout of the development that doesn't hang together, and it may be as much of a, uh, a site attribute as it is to uh, anything else. There's only one, one way, most generally speaking, to get from Wells Road to um, the, uh, what's the other road? Sawyer Road. Uh, and that's from point A to point B. You can wiggle all different configurations <laughs> to get there, but there's, uh, you know, that, that's, that's a given. Um, but I think in some of the other situations where there's a number of dead-end cul-de-sacs, particularly with hammerheads on them, the thought of, of uh, I think everyone enjoys going for a Sunday drive, and, and uh, it's nice to go, particularly if you have a, a road that connects from Wells over to uh, Sawyer, to go in and, and see, you know, part of your community, uh, just as people go to Fort Williams and they enjoy j driving down Sawyer Road. I think this development also would afford that opportunity. People would like to get out and see what the, what the zoning implications are, what the, uh, how the town has dealt with its, with its growth area. So to that extent, uh, I know dead-end roads provide good neighborhoods, that there's a good security there, but I think some of the latest thinking in terms of overall development patterns that they also lead to uh, lack of continuity between uh, neighborhood. You can live on one cul-de-sac and never know the people on the other. And I, 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 for at least on some of those long cul-de-sacs, and I understand why they occur, I think it would be helpful to actually have uh, my preference as an eye drop, but again, I'm not going to uh, teardrop. I'm not going to design these, uh, this thing, but uh, I always feel like I'm at the end of a development that has another phase ahead of it when I get to a, a, a hammerhead turnaround. Uh, and I think something in a teardrop shape working around natural attributes is a way of, of clearly defining that it's the end of the project. It's more of a rural area. It's not a circular uh, cul-de-sac. Uh, open space and buffering trails. I mean, you look at the map and you look at the green to white, uh, there's a significant amount of open space uh, being provided. I agree with Steve's comment, given the number of children that probably are going to be moving in here, or just the, to be sure that there is the opportunity, as the town manager noted, that there's a, an area where, where uh, even adults and children can gather, or adults can gather to, you know, uh, have some outdoor recreation. Again, keeping in mind that uh, we have a, one of the uh, area's uh, most highly regarded home builders. We have. Uh, consultants have some of the highest reputations in the state of Maine for engineering and planning, and we'd like to take advantage of that in this process. Uh, phasing is, it, it seems pretty logical. I haven't looked at it in great detail. Uh, I think that the, the key issue with phasing is to be sure that each phase uh, succeeds on its own merits, that there's a sense of completion and a sense of uh, neighborhood, and uh, you're not waiting for that next great big bang from the next phase to uh, to really provide the uh, amenities for the first phase.
I think that's as far as I can get on the list tonight. Like to have, Mr. Wilcox. In terms of refining the common space, I think uh, some development of some idea of what it's used for and what the actual physical characteristics are of the common space, uh, and how those would be maintained during the life of the of the neighborhood after the developer is no longer part of the, the project, I think would be interesting to learn more about those. Uh, whether they become, well, wherever they may be, but it does seem to be uh, like it's not exactly a central focus to the neighborhood at this point in time. Do you, do you have plans at this point in time for what that would what that would be? A Maureen lawn, and I have talked about that. Or I, a, I or might, stroll I, through a field. Or? Yeah, I, I don't want to you know, try and respond to everybody's comments, and I appreciate all of your okay, that's okay. your study comments. Doesn't need to. Bring up the speed about what we've talked about with, between Maureen and the manager, and he, of course, wrote a memo um, addressing that. There is a, a movement in town right now to try and identify fairly large areas for flat open space for ball fields and so forth. Obviously, this is not the place to look for you know flat, well drained, you know suitable areas. But uh, the area that we're showing right here was selected because it was at the, the junction of those two roads. It also offered a fantastic view off to the marsh. And we felt that because of that, it made sense uh, to consider that as a, as a focal point for that first phase of development. Uh, the details of it have yet to be worked out. Maureen has already informed us we probably should come before the planning board at some point along the line with some specific understanding of how it's going to be treated in terms of grading, landscaping, any structures, and so forth. Um, we've also talked um, with Maureen, the manager, and several of the department heads about providing someplace else on the property for a space um, to be used for what I don't know at this point, maybe a basketball court or just an informal play area. Um, <coughs> we've identified a, a place over here um, on the, the right side of the Leighton Road as you cross the power line. Uh, the advantage of that space is that it is relatively centrally located with an easy walking distance, both by trail and the sidewalk, towards all three phases. Um, there are some, there's a wonderful house site over there, which we cannot use because it's within the 250 buffer zone of a large wetland down here. But if it could be graded properly, it could be made into a very attractive uh, wooded recreation area. The use of it, I don't know. It could be an informal play area. It could be an open field. It could be a place for adults to gather. It could be a common barbecue, picnic area, it could be a small tot lot, any number of things could happen right there. That's the sort of thing which you may want to look at when you go out on, on a sidewalk. Mr. Russell? Mr. Chair, I, you mentioned some things and I, the key thing, and Peter had mentioned you know, a tot lot, and I, I don't think it matters whether it is a tot lot, which is a very 70s uh, concept of, of these little playground areas and so forth. It doesn't matter, I, to me anyway, as much what it is, as long as it connects to these houses. In other words, you can put up six tot lots if you want to, but it isn't, if it's not where people congregate, people, they're going to be empty tot lots. Um, what I'm looking for is, is something um, that both visually and physically centers or centralizes this neighborhood and phase two. I, I think your phase three, I'm willing to concede as an estate section, and just that type of estate lots don't lend themselves to neighborhoods, uh, to be blunt about it. Uh, they are them in, in themselves, the uh, little estates. So I'm looking mostly for those, these two, phase one and phase two, and I'll, I'll give two examples of what I'm talking about. One is a village green in, in Woodstock, Vermont, which is just this very long, like a stretched out football area of a village green. This is not a village as such, this is a neighborhood. But something that is, is more than a, an eyebrow on the road, but actually more of a space. Yeah, I, I recognize that people can cross the street to gather in a space, but if it's going to be a space to gather for people in the neighborhood, make it so it can fit 
45 children or, or 16 adults. Or if they want to have a summer barbecue for the neighborhood, it, they can set up a little tent and, and have something going on there. So it, and it's central to the neighborhood. Um, another one, and I haven't been there since it's been as fully developed as it is, is, is um, I think Summer Place. There was a picture in the paper recently. Um, has a central uh, sort of village green with a gazebo um, where you, from all of the porches basically on, in, in the surrounding homes you can oversee, you can see your kids playing down at this local area. That's the type of cohesiveness that I'm talking about as far as maybe that can be worked into what you have for, have chosen for a an open spot here. I, I would recommend that you expand that that lot by say 50 feet to the south um, just to, to get enough area if you, if you choose to make it there but do something that makes it visually and physically central to this neighborhood and also phase two, uh, whatever other lot. Um, enough said. Charles, one question. Will there be architectural restrictions on the homes? I'm just saying, I was really thinking about, you know, a three-car garage facing the road, three or four of those homes, that kind of a thing. I know you can get into ranch style and tutors and all that, too, but I mean, as far as we're talking so much here this evening about appearance and how it would look down from Spurwink and down from uh, the lower end of the marsh, <clears throat> I'm just wondering what the plan, what your plans are as far as designing that, you might call it a show window. Uh, it's going to be very evident, of course. And Typically, when an asset alone just lays out a new neighborhood, they'll develop a palette of buildings that have some common theme or common elements. And then people who approach them to build a house there will make a selection from the palette that's already predetermined. And we'll be prepared to come before you with some examples of homes. We provide you with a number of homes already. So they are really locked in as the building contractor and designer and what have you on this project. Right. Right, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Elmer. Uh Just a couple of other thoughts. Uh, I know there's a tree planting plan as part of the package. Again, I think that's, that's quite a challenge in terms of trying to presuppose where the trees need to be until the uh, right of way or the construction is, is uh, completed. But uh, again, I don't, the, the the irony here is whether this is this is a development within the woods or whether the woods are gone and and we need to bring in the street trees to create this uh, main street uh, village atmosphere and I and I think it gets caught right in between where it's neither one or the other and it's that unusual um, development scenario that that makes us all feel a little bit like we're in New Jersey whenever there's a uh, another subdivision done. Um, so that's, that's just a comment. That's not a question. I, I, I think as we walk the site and, and look at things and you start talking about trees to be saved, I think, and we look at the density of the lots and how big the houses are and, and, and what's a reasonable expectation in terms of uh, where the, how far the houses are set back, what the character of that public right-of-way takes on and the character of the, of the neighborhood. Um, but as an example, uh, no one in this room was involved with this development, so I'll just, I won't mention it by name. It's in a, an adjacent community. It's a very nicely uh, laid out subdivision. Again, it's a long, windy road up and over Dale and uh, through some trees and through some open fields, but ends in a, in a, in a round cul-de-sac, and at the end of that cul-de-sac is an enormous house. Uh, but it's a shingle-style house, and it, and it can be sort of fit into everything. But what happened is I believe that house owner bought all of the lots on the cul-de-sac and then proceeded to put a, what I would call a uh, suburban um, swimming pool white uh, steel fence. It's not a wrought iron fence. It's, it's not rustic. It's very much what you would see put around a swimming pool in a suburban backyard. And that's a very jolting thing. Uh, I mean, uh, again, maybe this is too high a standard, but one's expectation is that you come in here and maybe there's a remnant of a stone wall or maybe there's some stone walls and maybe someone would put up some uh, a wood fence, whether it's rail or, or anything else. That seems to be somewhat consistent. And I think the uh, people's personal choices are their business. I mean, they work their lives. They want to build their dream house. Some people want to put up a, a southern a uh, mansion, other people want to put up a nice cape someplace, and uh, that's, that's everyone's business. But the public right-of-way is something that can sort of control um, those issues and, and bring all of those things together. And I think that's the challenge for this board, working 
uh, with you through this application is to come up with something that we all feel reasonably comfortable with in terms of the alignment of the road and location of the lots and size of the lots so that uh, regardless of people's personal choices for uh, house types and, and sizes, uh, it all sort of nestles in or if it's not supposed to nestle in, it all sort of jumps out as, as uh, a statement. Uh, but I, I see that as a challenge as we go through the process. <clears throat> uh, just a couple of comments. Most of the things that I had thought of have either been touched on or, or very much covered. Um, you said the traveled way is going to be 20 feet in the road? For the most part. Okay, and then plus a five foot es esplanade and a five foot sidewalk. Ex with now, the exception yeah. of the, the one section of road um, up in here, where because of the length of dead end road situation, we have to make the road 24 feet west. Okay, now in those esplanades, you are planning on planting street trees, correct? Um, that's something which, be, which we have to coordinate with, with Rick Churchill about whether or not that's the most desirable place to put the trees relative to snow plowing, snow dumping, and so forth. Okay. It, it seems to me that um, <clears throat> in applications passed, we have refer referred to um, the Stonegate subdivision, that I think it was the first phase of cutting too much of a swath through the trees. And, you know, if we do the simple math here, we've got 40 feet of just flat space without any trees to break it up. It's going to be maybe a slightly smaller version of the same thing. Um, as one board member and also um, in the profession that I'm in, uh, I would like to see proposed restrictive covenants for the neighborhood um, for things such as satellite dishes and all the, the gobbly gook that goes along with it. Um, I guess I'd like to see more about uh, landscaping of entrances and uh, the common areas. And the common areas, um, I'm going to get a little personal here, but I live in a neighborhood in this town that has, I think, 190 some odd houses in it. <clears throat> We're <clears throat> excuse me, fortunate enough to have a fair amount of uh, coastline going along with our neighborhood. So the neighbors have a place to meet, which is common to the neighborhood. This neighborhood is not going to have that benefit. It, it, the people in the neighborhood need some place where they can meet, even if it's only once a year for the Fourth of July picnic or something or other, some place where they feel as though they can go and not be infringing on other people's you know, lots, area. Now maybe um, the neighborhood will find a space within the open space that they can do that naturally. I don't know. Don't know the topography well enough. I don't know the land well enough. <clears throat> but it does seem to be a very, very important element when you're going to be putting in 96 families in a fairly small area of, of land, actually. Um, Echo a couple of other things that have been touched on. The impact on schools um, does concern me. The um, community impact analysis, I think, is an absolutely critical thing that has to be done, and I think it needs to be done fairly quickly. Um, and I think that's about it at this point. Tom was really the only person that touched directly on the issue of the location of the entrance onto Wells Road. Can I have a sense of the board as to where they stand on, on that issue? That really is one of the, you know, the underpinnings towards the start of the road design. I think that we've, as indicated in our application material, have looked at it long and hard. We've talked with our own consultant. We've talked with TYLN. We've talked with the police and fire department. And we're very comfortable with a, where it is, and B, with what we've done to try and prevent any unreasonable impact on the abutter who would be affected by it. Mr. Retzel? Yeah, it was the first issue that I brought up, and, and my perspective on that was less that I didn't like where it was right now, but I want to make sure that because of the, all of the concerns that you'd fully um, gone over every other possibility. Um, I'm not, uh, and I asked you to, to just go back over that, and then you gave me a lot of reasons and vertical 
uh, sight distance uh, on the further stretch and so forth. And, and I don't know the answer there. I do concur with, with Tom, however, where I'll, that may, from all of the safety <coughs> perspectives, be the right location. Um, it, is, it's a, it seems to have this very odd sense of <coughs> beginning of this subdivision to wind up through no presence of neighborhood and then come to a, an intersection and all of a sudden you're there. Um, it, it just it doesn't have that, that sense of, of uh, introduction to the neighborhood that, that many entrances do. That's a, that's a characteristic of the site. It's a difficult piece that you have to work with. And I agree with that. I don't know that there's anything yeah. I can do with it. What I am saying is, um, from my perspective, as long as you have fully exhausted all of the possibilities. Initially, I thought, well, you know, why wouldn't the, um, to take care of some of that, that horizontal site distance at the, the, the Perez residence, um, that they um, give land to uh, the town and, and just change the orientation, you know, bring that curve in. I don't think there's enough space there to do that. You know, I, I came to that on my own resolution there. Uh, I thought that that was an opportunity to, to, to shorten up that, that, that turning uh, I, I guess as long as I feel fully satisfied that you've exhausted all the possibilities that where you have planted now is, is sufficient, it is just makes it a very difficult and, and uh, sort of lackluster entrance to... Uh, well, we're, we're hoping by the design and the detailing of it, it'll be less than mm -hmm. lackluster, it'll be a real yeah, positive. I, I, that's an unfair word, and I didn't mean it well, yeah. derogatory at all, I really didn't. Uh, but I think that we're also maybe dealing with cross-purposes here. You know, on one hand, we hear people's concern for the visual impact of the project, the number of houses, what's going to do to the woods, the tree line, and so forth which probably would be much greater if we were to concentrate everything down by Wells Road. Uh, the other problem with coming in right by you know, the ac access point right now is that the road is down here, where you want it to be is up here. It's going to require quite a bit of switchbacking or modification to the land uh, to get up to that level. And I'm not so sure you're going to feel like you're going right into a neighborhood by making that, that transition in grade. It, it's a difficult question, and you know, it's one that we've wrestled with a long time, and I, I honestly believe that where we have it is probably the best of, of the three locations that we could have put it. Any other, <coughs> excuse me, any other comments? Uh, I'll make another comment on the, on the entryway. I guess that's one of the areas that in terms of its development, uh, needing to see uh, that it is developed as a, as a, as an entrance uh, commensurate to the design of the rest of the subdivision. At this point, it sort of bears the earmarks more of a secondary access road uh, that's just sort of shoehorned in and not only that, kind of shunted off to the side without any sort of sense of, of arrival. It may end up being something that just generates a lot of traffic from what looks like uh, <coughs> relatively inconspicuous side road because of the way it has to be squeezed right down, right down there. And I'm not sure whether or not it's the sense of, uh, of uh, what you find as you come up to the top of the hill and you still don't really get anything yet. You have to go further and around another turn and then you hit sort of just a straight, you know, a plain crossroad type thing that's in terms of an arrival to, to some places. Which is not to say that big gate amenities and whatnot make subdivisions, but on the other hand, there needs to be, I think in terms of design, something that kind of makes you feel like this is a place. Yeah, that it's, it's that again, that challenge. quandary. Do we make a road which looks like a lot of other nice residential roads in you know, southern Maine, you know, windy, go through the woods and so forth? Or do we make a place that you know, screams out at you, I am a place with stone walls and plantings and signs and lights and so forth. I think we're trying to straddle that, that, that line right now. We have not provided you with any design details for the entranceway because, you know, among ourselves, we're still arguing those points. And I think that's what we need to hear some of the comments like what you just made. 
I, I guess uh, in terms of, I'll, I'll echo what, what Steve said, you know, there may be an opportunity that you're missing, uh, but it's hard to, you know, we, I think you've chosen a logical approach. As always. Yeah, I, I'd like to think we're also choosing a path of least resistance relative to wetlands and yes. some of those other forces that are really beyond our control. It, it would have been beautiful to, to fill in some of the wetlands as you round the curve there and have a nice neighborhood that you drive through. But the reality is that we're approaching two acres of wetland fill right now and going downward from that, I might add. Any other comments? How would the no, uh, no, what would the board like to do at this point? <coughs> Chair, I, I would like uh, I, I think I'd like to ask the the applicant. Um, I mean, we've tried to cover some some bigger global issues. You know, get you in the right direction. Do you have questions of where you know to come back in thirty days uh, to be able to? To bite off another big hunk and maybe be a little more specific, uh, what would you like? Any well, more we pressure? we would really like to go back before the board uh, next month for public hearing, and hear what the public has to say about some of those large issue items as well as some of the details, because we've tried to address both of those in our dealings with the public so far. I think that uh, in the intervening month we'll take a look at some of those issues, specifically open space. Uh, we can look once again at like the entrance way and how that's going to be treated. Um, Fred Morin has raised some very legitimate concerns, I think, about the eyebrows. And I, I haven't heard a consensus on the part of the board whether or not they feel, or you feel that that's a good idea or are lukewarm to the concept. Um, so I think you've certainly given us a lot of directions. I, I can't imagine that um, we're going to be doing any major reshaping of the um, of the subdivision, just knowing as much as we do about the land. I, I was not trying to be critical of the eyebrows as such. I, I, my comment regarding those, we, we don't try to make those the, the centerpiece of it. Okay. Yeah, we, we were, it was never our intention to make okay. those into a usable okay. area. Okay. Uh, otherwise than that, you know, from a safety and, and engineering perspective, uh, yeah, the town engineer doesn't like them. Um, they have some benefits, they have some drawbacks visually. I, I agree with Tom, maybe we need to get in the site and stand there and say this is where we're proposing this one and that one and so does it make sense? Uh, I've certainly seen a number of subdivisions that have them. Um, some are, are confusing, some are work very well, they're very, you know, they're very a nice accent to a neighborhood, but again not the center of, uh, of a neighborhood. Enough. I guess any, anything else that, that you have of us uh, I agree we should probably proceed to a, a public hearing if that's uh, for schedule. And probably wait till just after that next meeting for an, a second sidewalk. Or? I think it might depend on snow cover. Snow cover and, and, and public reaction, I think. Uh, I mean, to see if we can have any major um, changes that, that we need to wait for, but uh, assuming not. Well, assuming that we have one public he hearing and it doesn't get extended like some have in the past, it would seem appropriate that the public has an opportunity again to go on the site walk mm -hmm. um, prior to the public hearing, um, to, have a, to have a public hearing and then have the site walk afterwards and then the public unable to respond to issues that, that uh, were raised during the, during the site walk not, may not be uh, productive to either the public input or, or to the consultant getting uh, all the input they need from the, from the public in a site walk. Yeah, okay, we, we should go for, on the site walk, open the public prior to the public hearing? Yes. <clears throat> in, unless the public hearing is held over uh, two different meetings. Is there a public hearing at final review as well as preliminary? You have the option of holding one. We have the option of as many as we want as for the mm -hmm. public hearing. We certainly get uh, major subdivisions that have had more than one <coughs> public hearing before. I would suggest that we hold a public hearing at our next meeting, and if shortly thereafter we schedule the site walk, if there's any real public debate that comes up in the site walk, we have the option to hold another public hearing. 
Mm -hmm. I would go along with that. Would like to, someone like to put that in the form of a motion? I can't find it. <laughs> I'm too tired to speak until we... Thank you, Alex. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, be it ordered that the uh, completed the uh, application, which has been deemed complete this evening, be tabled to the regular March 19th, 96 Planning Board meeting, at which time a public hearing shall be had, held. <laughs> I'll say that. Any further discussion? I would like to say one thing before we vote. I made several comments about the engineer's review and uh, the specificity of their review. Um, there's no way this, that's not intended to be a public attack on what the, the town engineer is doing. The town engineer is doing exactly what the town engineer is supposed to be doing at this uh, point in the process. My, my issues are not with the town engineer. They're, they're just a general concern about how much detail is necessary to, to get the planning process moved in a uh, fruitful manner. There's any number of cases where an application of this size could come through and under threats of moratorium or any other reason the applicant could dump the whole thing, complete in our laps and the DEP simultaneously, and, and we'd have a, a, a whole different situation. So I just, for the public record, want to be sure that it's clear that uh, Fred Morin and, and his people put in a lot of hours and hard work here. I'm not uh, criticizing him or his firm. You suggested one time earlier in the discussion, seems like hours ago, that we may want to invite Fred in to have some discussion if it's, if it's warranted. What I'm talking about is a general uh, workshop session that deals with the subdivision review process. Uh, I've heard a lot of concerns from various uh, firms that there's just so much information that's required at the preliminary uh, process that you never really get an opportunity to deal with the substantive issues. You're, you're diving into riprap details and, and uh, profiles and all those things that are expensive to change uh, once you get into the process. But I don't want to revisit that specific to this application. As you said earlier, we are where we are. Hopefully we'll have a better sense <laughs> a week from tomorrow once the dueling engineers. <laughs> Maureen? Um. In response to the concern expressed, I, I've had conversations with the applicant about the Fred's le level of, of review, and I'm really glad he does that level of review, and this is a record size of, of a letter that I've seen from Fred. Um, but one of, the th one of the things the board may want to think about now, um, because this is rel it's a relatively unique project for this town to deal with, is perhaps that Fred continued to do his review but that the applicant put on hold trying to turn around plans in the next week and a half on responding to those technical issues because you could easily be redesigning based on those things and then as the board gets into a substantive discussion um, have to redo the work all over again. Um, and, and perhaps the board may want to think about that and, and tell the applicant, you know, keep, keep, keep the list of, of comments um, but not try to revise the plans right now. Um, just to work on, on making some conceptual decisions about whether generally the road is in the right place and, and, and whether the lot layout is generally acceptable before you go in and make sure all, all, the, all the plans have the elevations of the catch basins at the right place. We're running the same situations in terms of dealing with DEP. We had a, a, a pre-submission meeting with Mary Beth Richardson within the last couple of days at the Portland office of DEP, recognizing that Fred had a lot of concerns. You obviously have some concerns. We want to get the DEP process started. Uh, she's told us that you know, uh, pending the receipt of the application, we could probably be looking at a three to five month review period. Um, we'd like to think that that's going to follow the parallel track with the planning board here, and we're both going to arrive at the finish line about the same point. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to be you know, going back and making countless iterations, because we have 42 pages uh, of drawings, each one, each one of which has to have at least one or two uh, adjustments to be made. So that's, that's our intent right now, is to keep a running track of what <coughs> needs to be attended to, both at the microscopic level and the, the macro level. 
I would fully support that. I have no interest whatsoever in getting another package like this uh, with corrections on it. Uh, you know, we have uh, competent people doing the work. We have uh, a process established. Uh, if you can keep track of Fred's comments, uh, many of them may not may not apply once we get uh, further into the review process. Those that do, uh, we can deal with. I mean, ultimately, what what we're dealing with here is is checking construction documents for accuracy and consistency. Uh, and it's just it's an enormous effort and uh, when we have professional registered engineers accountable for the for the for the work that's sitting in front of us it's 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 mind-boggling that we do get to that. during the DEP review with yeah, Ross Cutlets and DEP staff members yeah I, I don't want to have to feel bad about asking for changes I, I think that uh, out of fairness we have a complete application with more detail than I ever want to know about at this level of review at this time in review and uh, I, I, I agree completely with uh, Maureen's uh, suggestion. I, I agree as well. I mean, it's just a matter of timing. I, I, I didn't even read Fred's comments, to be perfectly honest with you, because I needed to get to, and I didn't get to everything in this package without the detail. There will be a time when I, in the past, although that's a pretty awesome package he has, uh, sort of religiously go through his, his references station by station, and, and just so I know what he's talking about and, and uh, you know, you get a grasp of it to a, to a certain extent, but I don't need to deal with that now. And I think uh, the, the problem comes with, with sort of resourcing this or, or storing all of these uh, changes and, and how do you go back two or three months from now and say, oh, yeah, that's the one we needed to change because we're still, we're still there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's the frustrating part. Fred is, does, a, does a great job at what he does. He really does. Um, it's just I don't need to look at it right now. I guess it comes back to a discussion of how how the board is going to be reviewing the project. Is it going to be done primarily by staff, Maureen, consultants, or is the board going to go through following either this checklist or some other list on a point by point basis? What's what's the most expeditious way of getting through this mountain of material? I think we're on a good start right now. <laughs> I'll, I'll just speak. I think the a planning board's responsibility is, is to deal with issues related to the community-wide and the comprehensive planning issues and the bigger picture issues related to a development and not to micro-analyze a uh, application to the point where we're questioning the size of the riprap based on uh, cubic feet per second uh, formulas. I think that's purely the purview of the engineer. We, we take the engineer's record. If there's something about the design that we disagree with fundamentally, then we bring that to the attention. If the engineer comes up with a letter that says this is the worst set of drawings I've ever seen and uh, you shouldn't even consider this application, then that obviously triggers something for the board to consider. But uh, I don't have any interest in micro-engineering this, this application. I think we have a, a town engineer, and normally this board looks to the town engineer's general comments, not the specific criticisms of whether drawings are, are coordinated and, and uh, those sorts of issues. I, I want to deal with the bigger picture issues. I don't want to deal with the, the complexities of, of coordinating title blocks and all of those issues. <coughs> Mr. Wilcox. Well, um, I think one of the benefits that we have at this point in time of having so much information brought to us is that some of the things which uh, may be bigger picture bigger picture type issues that normally don't get fleshed out until after more detailed engineering work are done have come to light. And things like uh, large uh, interventions into the landscape for a detention basin right on the edge of Wells Road become apparent. And therefore we can start focusing as we go out into the, into the field to see exactly what, what that is for an impact. So it's on that, in that essence it's good to see. I, I would agree with that, but I, I don't even believe that that requires detailed uh, engineering drawings. I, that's a sort of a conceptual drainage scheme that shows where you're going to run the drainage and where you're going to have the detention mm -hmm. basins. Yeah. Uh, Although we have less, less engineering drawings already. <laughs> but I, mean, I, I think those discoveries, this is outside this application, but yeah. those dis discoveries can be made with less than a complete set of construction documents, a preliminary uh, design application. <clears throat> Any other comments? No. Does everyone remember the uh, 
<laughs> motion. Motion. Yeah. Motion was to table the public hearing. Right. Yep, just kidding. Um, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. Those opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you next month. Um, other business, um, planning board goals, and what we have before us are draft goals to be approved by the planning board and for the, the town council. <laughs> it's an item we've talked about at workshop and more than once. Um, are there any comments that anyone would like to make? None. Does this uh, require a motion to? I believe it does. I didn't, I didn't draft your motion, but just a motion, you know, a basic a motion I have a, a motion for the board to consider findings of fact. <laughs> <laughs> Be ordered. Oh, I, with the fault. Ordered, Additions. That, uh, <laughs> that uh, we submit the planning board goals to the uh, town council as written. Second. All those in favor, in favor please raise no your right discussion. hand. All those opposed? <laughs> Is there any discussion? Yeah, I wanted to include the uh, turtle with the uh, There's one more motion we need. I'll um, move that the meeting be adjourned. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? <laughs> <laughs> I woke up that crew on that. <laughs>